Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to today's webinar, an introduction to digitizing videotapes. Um, just a few housekeeping things before we get started. So first of all, you've probably seen we are recording this meeting um, and it, the recording, as long as a copy of Rob's slides will be available within about a day or two from this webinar, as soon as we can get it up and we'll let you all know. Um, as per our usual policy, we ask that you keep your mics and cameras off just during the presentation, just so we can save bandwidth um, on this call. And I've spoken with Rob and feel free throughout the presentation. If you have questions to put them in the chat, we can answer them throughout. Um, Rob has said that is OK. And before I get into introducing him, I do just want to do a land acknowledgement. So call CBPA members sit on the unceded and traditional territories of the Mi'kmaq, Bayathuk, Inu, Inuit, Wolastuwiag, and Pascatamukadi peoples. Treaties of peace and friendship were first signed in 1725 between the British Crown and the Mi'kmaq and Wolastuwiag peoples. The treaties did not deal with the surrender of lands and resources, but recognized Mi'kmaq and Wolastuwiag title and established the rules for what was to be an ongoing relationship between nations. We acknowledge with respect the diverse histories and cultures of the first peoples of this region, and we express our gratitude as guests on this land. So from here, I'm going to be turning it over to Rob, who is a sound and moving image archivist um, for the Provincial Archives. Thank you so much, Rob, for being here. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, a special thank you to Evan Eccles. I don't think he's here today, but he was the one who asked me to do this. So I am happy to share my knowledge with anybody who um, is interested. Um, obviously, you can see on the, hopefully everybody's seeing my info on the screen here. So uh, if you do have any other further questions after the fact, you can email me. I, We'll get back to you and I have uh, a free time. Uh, some people may or probably less likely to know. Uh, we just, I'll talk a little bit about it later with our, our YouTube channel, which kind of has kind of exploded. So I've been kind of a little t extra busy with that right now, but uh, I will always find time to um, make sure that I can assist in any way that possible that I can. Um, so, yeah, this is going to give a brief overview of what we do here at the Provincial Archives, New Brunswick. Um, with a, I'm more of a tech person, less of a theory person. I have my background is more has been more a hands on approach. Um, I just have a hit. I have a history degree and a sound engineering degree um, or certificate, whatever you want to call it. Um, so I, I didn't go to school specifically for archives. I just kind of fell into the job. Um, and then uh, been at the Provincial Archives since November 2008. So been around a little bit. Um, uh, my main focus, I guess, with when it comes to video in terms of the format, I'm, I'm going to just mostly talk about VHS because that's the most probably most familiar format for everybody and probably the most common format people will probably come across. Um, but the application of uh, digitizing video will be the same regardless of, uh, at least in the terms of a cassette-based format, will pretty much be similar. Um, the other thing I'll mention is that we are kind of in a, I mean, like most places, we're always, we're kind of in a big reevaluation system right now, and I'll cover a little bit about what we're reevaluating over the course of the the uh, presentation. So uh, first thing I'll mention is the team, past and present. Um, obviously, not, not just myself, but uh, Dennis Noel, who uh, he actually started the sound and moving images section for uh, PANB, um, basically saw the value and what sound and moving images would bring to uh, retaining. Um, and he was, he wasn't very, the most technical person, but he was very, he was very good at um, getting, uh, he had the gift of the gab and he was good at talking to people and making, you know, we were able to secure a lot of equipment uh, through donations uh, because of him. 
and he is you know uh, a key person to basically to the way we are now uh, my colleague, uh, Elena, current colleague, Elena Cobb, she actually retires in the end of December. Um, she's been a workhorse in, as she started, I think, with film, and then as she's been doing tremendous work with, uh, with the audio section. And then we've had numerous students, interns, and volunteers doing a lot of inputting, uh, as we all know, if we, those of had to actually had to handle dealing with uh, sound and moving image material. Uh, it takes a lot of time to go through because some of these things could be, you know, VHSs, six hour long VHSs are not fun to uh, go through. Um, yeah, uh, just a scope of what we do. So because we're provincial, we're our main scope is New Brunswick, but we do sometimes venture into uh, the Maritimes sur and surrounding areas, which sometimes includes Maine, um, just because of whatever comes in. Uh, sometimes they just get all lumped together, um, and we get anything from home movies. Artistic, artistic expressions are kind of like, uh, I'm talking about like uh, music albums, uh, we have the New Brunswick Film Co-op Collection, which is short films and feature films and all that sort of thing. Uh, oral histories, obviously. Uh, we also, because of our the resources that we have, um, compared to some of the smaller institutions, we do uh, hold on to, we are sort of the repository for those smaller institutions and so our smaller archives and museums because they don't have the ability to digitize pay for equipment, that sort of thing. Um, so sometimes we assist them in that regards. Um, we also handle, uh, because we're government, we also deal with the government record portion of that as well, which is has its own challenges. Um, other thing, uh, our considerations for digitization, um, the priority kind of comes from like we give the tax the tax receipts requests uh, private donors. So we try to do our best to when uh, private donations come in that they they can request copies of the material because a lot like ninety nine percent of the time they don't have any other way to view the material themselves. So uh, we pr provide an access copy to them. Um, same thing when institutions do bring material, some, sometimes we have to break it down to smaller bits and send it a little bit at a time. Uh, other considerations are the age and condition. Um, so uh, videotape in particular um, is, doesn't have a particularly long shelf life. I've been digitizing uh, some tapes that are uh, older than me from so, so like late 70s, early 80s. Uh, some of them holding up well, some of them not. It all depends on the, uh, how well they were held. Um, uh, what else? Um, like I said, we're kind of in a reevaluation because Elena's retiring at the end of the year. Uh, current model is that we've kind of segmented the our section into the three main categories. Um, the plan is uh, to when uh, Elena retires that I'm going to try to take over just dealing with digitization and uh, processing stuff that needs to be digitized and then have an archivist who just deals with the processing of material that's doesn't need to be digitized right away. And I hope that maybe that will make our workflow a little easier to work with. Um, but that's to be determined next year. Um, in terms of what I'm tackling right now for video, um, I'm dealing with the UMATIC format, which is like the very first cassette based format. Uh, it's a pro uh, it was a professional format. Um, that did start in the 70s and was well used into the 90s. 
uh, for various things. Um, they also had their own pull tabs for uh, recording. So they had these little tabulars things that held in there and that's how you record over it. But I've decided to uh, save them. Maybe it went, when I'm finally done all of them, I might do something with them, but I have this little box here full of tabs. I've heard that some archives actually make, I think it's in Ontario, they make earrings out of them. Uh, so just repurposing things, always interesting. Um, VHS is definitely up there on the scale in terms of age because there are some really because vhs did start coming out in the late 70s so we've been dealing with that um i'm not nobody else saying anything so um in terms of access uh and pac-man no that's not the video game um so our we have our own in-house database system uh provincial archives collection management um so uh, this was sort of developed around the t just around the same time I think A to M was in production, so like mid 2000. Um, we're actually in the that's also in a process of being uh, having its uh, bare bone the skeleton of it essentially being rebuilt because the coding system that it was built on is has gotten outdated, so we needed to update that. So I'm actually on the committee to uh, getting the, the pre-release of it and dealing with um, all the error checking and all that sort of thing. And then uh, in terms of ac public access, we don't, we're still in the process of working towards granting access. So we just started the YouTube, uh, Specifically talking about sound and moving images, uh, we started the YouTube quietly, well, intentionally quiet, doing a quiet launch of our own YouTube channel. Um, it has since kind of got exploded a little bit with popularity. Uh, you may have seen it in the news. I've done a few interviews in regards to our uh, Department of Transportation films. So we, I have I also handle the film scanning as well. So I've been scanning these. Google Street View type videos um, and putting them online. Uh, there's like th over 300 reels for this particular collection, but the, my main goal is to try to get as many, as much coverage without overlap before I start maybe looking at a secondary coverage of uh, uh, existing routes. Excuse me. Um, yeah, one thing about, yeah, we're still also part of uh, working with uh, our Pac-Man system. I still, our, our original setup was FileMaker Pro databases, and then we converted the main databases into Pac-Man. We still have some legacy databases that need to be brought in so that's a little bit of the next challenge and then obviously the other challenge is the sound of moving image is databases so I'll just try to see if I can just give you an example of what it kind of this is what the new version is going to look like and just sort of um, sort of the type of data that we're collecting in terms of this the uh, main ones so um, this one's actually, I screen capped this and this is actually at, with the sound. Um, uh, this one's the film one. So just like sort of, uh, yeah, some of the main ones here, just like dates, uh, the uh, languages, um, just general description, collection, all that stuff. Um, the comment section's kind of like the catch-all one for like, if there's any weird anomalies. So one of the things I've been trying to do with video is a lot of the times, either if it's stock footage, sometimes it can come with, doesn't come with bars and tone. Uh, so I wanted to denote that, but also um, a lot of times if they do add the bars and tones, it's done in the studio after, after the fact that it like, 
how it's shot out in the field doesn't always necessarily line up color wise and level wise with what the bars and tone is so i need to be uh, we're trying to be more proactive in noting that it doesn't line up and that's one of the things i guess with digitizing video is you may see that and you may set up your video to be in line with how they've set that up but it's always a good idea to in when you're to view take time to view the material to see what the actual levels are because sometimes again what's what they've put on what's actually been captured is doesn't necessarily get reflected from the bars and tone that's at the beginning um this one is of the film sort of thing so it's just like talking about the different exposure levels of the format uh with video let's see if i can pull up uh the video one here uh i hope everybody can see this because i think it's the entire screen uh Can people see the, or where is that? People can see that, the video thing. Any thumbs up? Okay. Yeah, so uh, mostly pretty basic. Uh, just talk about how many passes it takes. Uh, we For Umatic, we have a tape cleaner. We're very lucky to have one. Uh, most formats don't have, uh, we don't have a VHS or a Betacam cleaner in that regards. Um, so that kind of only applies to that one type of format. Um, I sometimes note the radio frequency, which is like an art, it, there's like a, some, some players, professional players will have a, like a needle that will tell you the signal strength. So that's just referring to that. Um, master tape, whether it's a master or not. And then I usually uh, denote the format and the quality and then, then the the, um, the branding of that. Um, for me, I found like, especially because I've done a lot of like over, uh, say 1500 pneumatic tapes at this point, um, having that knowledge for me at least is very useful because I, when I'm looking if I, it says umatic and it has the model, make a model, I can kind of have a good gauge of what to expect because uh, in one particular case, so this is the Scotch USA 20S, which is like the small base cassette base and Scotch is 3Ms. They're pretty good overall, but the Sony KCA 60s have, are the common ones that I come have come across where it, um, where it's been the most trouble to deal with and that's where i've had to like bake the tapes and all that fun stuff um so every every all three modules have this uh regular description and then the technical data that uh fits within that um i've been Again, one of these things I'm going to start looking at reevaluating to see what, if we need to add more things or change things up to be more better descriptive of. of uh, so when somebody's looking at it, they know what what they're looking at, the kind of difficulties they're going to deal with. Um, So uh, the actual digitization process, I meant to do a flow chart here, but it's a pain in the butt to do it in this program. Um, so yeah, right now our system, the way we're set up is we have, uh, we captured the 10 bit uncompressed and then, uh, then if, you know, if the edges need to be trimmed off, I will trim those off, export them and then dump them in uh convert them into ffv1 um in cases where the videotape is not done very uh has a hard time we have to do multiple passes with it 
So a lot of stopping and starting cleaning the machine. Um, there will be an editing process where I have to make sure that I capture start ca capturing before it started going bad the, the last time I was at the last point and then kind of cut it ideally to an actual cut point um, and then try to put it back together to be an accurate representation of what it actually is supposed to be and then export it. Um, and then once exported into an FFV1 and a proxy format, uh, the preservation file gets backed up to, we run a uh, LTO tape library system. Um, I'll talk a little bit more into that, but basically I will do uh, consistency checks uh, every six months just to make sure that the data is running well. Um, uh, I have in the past used JPEG 2000 as the video encoding format, um, but uh, once I, we get into the new iter like upgrade to a new iteration of tape, I'll probably look into scripting a format, scripting it so that the uh, JPEG 2000 files get put into the FFE one because that's always going to be the thing you have to think about with digital files is making sure that the code that you're using uh, a codec that's still being maintained and migrating into the next one as assuming that there is a next one because uh, again when I came in 2008 uh, there was still a lot of debate over what there's still kind of a lot of debate over what the format would be, but it seems like FFE1 seems to be kind of the the one a lot of people are sticking to. Um, so the kind of this is kind of like the breakdown of just all the components you kind of need: uh, the machine, the video machine, the playback machines themselves. A time-based corrector, which is what keeps the video stabilized, and then your analog to digital converter, computer, all the elements of the software and codecs, uh, your cables and other bits, and then your backup storage, whatever that may be, your either tape or a cloud-based system, um, maybe hard drives if that's your limitation. Um, the thing I will also note is with acquiring this type of material, uh, these types of equipment, particularly the video machines and the time-based corrector, uh, the has been got has gotten a lot harder to acquire such material. And usually, if you do find working stuff, it has gotten more expensive. So there used to be a website called Broadcast Store, and they. Um, they're based out of California and they were kind of like the place to buy the equipment because you knew it was like a old, the guy who ran it was like an old tech guy and he, you know, had a whole team of people worked on working on the equipment, make sure, you know, when you buy something from them, it's in working order and you know that it's a good machine and nothing, there's no issues. Uh, we had purchased some equipment from there in the past, but unfortunately, uh, as to date, the the owner has uh, he's an older older gentleman, so he his health has gone has been poor. So it nobody knows the state of what the equipment what what the deal is with the equipment. Uh, I've tried to reach out to some people, and nobody seems to have a an idea of what's going on with it. Um, it's been a while since I've checked in, but um, unfortunately now it's kind of like. You kind of have to take a gamble with uh, uh, eBay or any other online store because um, I don't know of any other super reliable websites that you can buy equipment from that you know for sure that you're going to, that A, it's going to show up and B, that it will be in the condition that they say it is in or a working condition. Um, So 
So we have, uh, for us, we have two systems currently in place. Uh, we have a legacy system. So the we have a Mac Pro tower that's from 2008 through an Agile IOHD box, which uses FireWire, which is like a basically a defunct um, system. Uh, luckily, it's still functioning. Um, I've had all, I've had to update the computer and the power supply on the Agile box has did uh, die out on me, but I was lucky enough to secure off the sh there. It was kind of like an off the shelf type part from an electronic store, so I was able to keep that going. Uh, so I just had to open it up and replace it, and it has been working great ever since. And that uses Final Cut Pro. Uh, these systems are also offline, so there's no connection to the internet whatsoever. Uh, and the Mac Pro the uses OS 10.5.8, I think is what I'm at. And I've kept it at that because the Agile box only works within a certain range of, um, of the OS X operating system. So if I was to update it to the current version, uh, it would actually not work anymore. So uh, that's one thing to be considerate of in the when it comes to having a piece of hardware that event that you hold on to for a long time uh, kind of falls out of um, with the uh, being maintained by the company. So uh, the other issue, the, well, the other thing is with computers is it's always a gamble when you update the operating system because it could end up breaking the software. So part of being offline means not being not being forced because sometimes machines end up getting forced into an update. So it, keeping it offline, I mean, for security purposes is great. It also keeps it from making changes to your unwanted changes to your system because you want um, you want reliability and making changes. Anytime you make a change to your system, you always are making that gamble that you end up may spending more time troubleshooting the machine, getting it to work again the way you want it to work again. And some in some cases, I've had the computer crash, the Mac Pro crash, and I've had to rebuild a lot of the uh, some of the presets that I have, which is another issue. So like w once I kind of have it, I've kind of in the mindset that once I have the computers all set up the way I want it to, I don't do make any changes unless I absolutely have to because I don't want to have the hassle of like, oh, if I update this, what ha do I have to spend like two or three days troubleshooting and that sort of thing. And that just take kills so much uh, production time. Um, our new and then our new system we've upgraded. We've bought a Mac Studio with the M2 chip, and we got a Blackmagic Studio HD box. Um, with that one, I've been using V Record for the capturing, and then Resolve for any editing. Um, I've just found that that's probably been the good, the best. Um, sort of working environment for me. Um, the idea will be hopefully uh, we'll probably end up with a similar second system whenever the Mac Pro ends up dying out. Um, um, but a lot of times like with Resolve, I'm mostly using that as a way to double check levels and do any, do any of the editing in that regard, similar to how uh, as opposed to like Final Cut Pro, which does the capturing and editing and exporting all in one go. Um, uh, so time-based correctors, uh, not everybody's ne necessarily familiar with them. So this, these pieces of equipment, um, they come in two flavors. We have external time-based correctors, which are the standalone units that 
their main goal is to well the main goal of a time based corrector is to make sure that you have a, a very stable signal um, uh, external ones allow you to have more control over the image process so uh, you see here there's kind of a bunch of different buttons so you have the video black chroma hue balance and timing so um, video is your uh, brightness their overall brightness and the black levels your, your black levels and then chroma is the color intensity and then the hue is kind of like the um basically moving the i guess they would use that they call that color on a regular old school tv but it's basically it, adjusting the overall color shift um and then balance is the has two functions where you can change the level of red or blue intensity and then timing is like the uh sometimes what you'll end up with is uh an image where you'll get a solid vertical black line on the left, usually on the left side of your screen, and vertical timing usually you have to allows you to shift the image le hor horizontally left, so that you don't have the cutoff on the right side, uh, or try to at least limit the amount of image that you're getting cut off on the edge. Um, this the top unit technically has the ability to have two built time based correctors in it, but we only have it for one uh, and the other we just purchased the 235 the one on the bottom this year um, speaking to taking a gamble we bought this off of uh, eBay um, I had to scour the internet for a, a manual for it because when it came to us it was actually in bypass mode so I had to f open it up and fi find some manuals so I can adjust the jumpers so that I could actually make the adjustments to the video found out that it was actually a big a lot of uh, it wasn't it had been ill maintained so i had to actually feed a bar and co uh, the bars color bars through it and like re make adjustments on it which is again if you're not a person who's um willing to just dig through equipment like in that regards it's it makes it even more of a challenge i guess um i've been used to i've kind of grown up around this type of tech and like growing up my dad would like the vhs machine's not working and he would just like give it put it lay it before me and be like hey how would you try figuring it out and i'm like i guess so so that's kind of i've just gotten used to that sort of thing um i know a lot of people usually don't have that um experience but yeah it's kind of the big challenge because like we used to have a guy actually in Halifax that would do our video deck repairs and he retired during the pandemic which is like that's the other big challenge I guess you know the people who have this knowledge are retiring um, so I've been kind of relying on the internet, YouTube, and just general websites that I've been come across um, in terms of like, what type of, how do I solve an issue or how do I do a drum repair, uh, swap and all that sort of stuff. Um, so yeah, and now the, the analog to digital converters. Uh, so like I say, our, the two that I have here are the ones that we use. So the one on top is the Agile IOHD, which is the one that's been our work workhorse since 2010. And then the Blackmagic ones below. Uh, Blackmagic's still pretty recent. So at least with this particular piece of equipment, it's still under warranty and being developed on. They also have a variety of different way, uh, levels for this type of device so there's like a 4k version if you're using a device that i guess you need to capture 4k footage from um, and then they also have this one's kind of more bare bones but they have a bigger rack mount version that has all has a variety of different inputs and outputs uh, i also want to mention quadriga video so cube tech out of quebec or not quebec germany um, it, 
they're a little bit pricier, but there is like they're kind of like the they have equipment that a lot that's a little more robust in terms of like you can get some automation machine automation with that sort of thing um but I, if i mean if you have that kind of uh, money to spend that's definitely the way to go but most likely more the more affordable option is this the black magic um and the price of uh, affordability for these things has come down so like to get the same quality so the agile box i think we bought used for like three grand back in 2010 and then the alt the black magic device was somewhere in the range of eight hundred dollars and can do it doesn't have all the same inputs but it still can capture the same you know uncompressed format in that regards um one thing I'll mention with uh in regards to uh black magic devices is that V record I think only is compatible with only communicates with black magic devices. There is I just still makes other devices modern, more modern device capture devices, but I don't think I think black magic devices are the only ones that if you're planning to use V record that they or the devices are compatible with. There might be another uh, company that it might work function with. I remember there used to be a bunch of other companies that archives used to recommend, but I don't know if they still are in season or if they've kind of disappeared. Um, so, Playback equipment or VTRs. Uh, in this case, again, talking about VHS. These we have we have several VHS machines. Some of them are uh, more consumer consumer based, uh, which we use to view material with if we just need to describe it. But these are our main digitization workhorses. Um, they're more on the high end. Um, they both play super VHS. Um, we do have a, a fair amount of that material, so it's very useful for us. Um, I will note that with, as I previously mentioned, with time-based correctors coming in two flavors, so because these are more modern VHS machines, the one on the top, as you can see, the glowing green light actually has a time-based corrector built into the machine. And it also uses, I think, a noise reduction on the audio, or I can't remember if it's a noise reduction for the video. Um, but you can just get away with using this VHS machine to go directly into your time base or into your digitizer um, without suffering from dropouts. Uh, the only issue is you don't have the ability to uh, adjust the image. In the same way you do with a time-based corrector so if the video itself comes in either too bright or too dark you don't really have a lot of you have to kind of hope that you can make a small adjustments in software and hope that the image quality turns out um, so the where I lost my thought here um yeah but the main thing i guess when it like if, as long as uh, with video you can be a little bit overexposed and bring it down in software and still kind of retain some uh some detail um but if it's too too high then you're kind of it's not going to come back it's still kind of wash out um if it's underexposed too much then you're kind of I mean, you're going to introduce graining, and that sort of happens both with video and if you're doing it with film. If it's too dark, you're still not, you, you're just going to have that problem. But it also, I mean, if it's baked into the image too, there's only so much you can kind of do with it, anyways. Um, the machine, the second, the Panasonic machine does have a slot for a time based corrector, but, but this one particular didn't come with it. Um, 
uh, I will also mention that with having having the two machines is very helpful in regards to. I found that um, some just because the tape doesn't doesn't play correctly in one machine doesn't mean it won't play correctly in another machine. Sometimes it will put like I'll put it in the one on the top, and it'll I'll get all kinds of artifacting out of it. But then I'll put it in the in the Panasonic machine and it'll play back. Maybe not perfect, but like a lot more manageable, maybe slight artifacting. So that's one thing. That's another thing to possibly consider. It's like if you get a machine and you're digitizing and it's not playing in that machine, probably uh, you can't assume that it's because the tape is in is completely gone. It, it could there could be some life in it just playing into another machine. I don't know what the reasoning why it will play in one machine and not the other, um, but uh, that's just a thing that I have observed over my period of, um, of digit uh, doing this work. Um, I've already talked about time-based correctors. Um, uh, so this is just kind of like a brief overview of the main connections you'll probably come across. So, uh, so S video, uh, not it's not super video, it's separated video. Um, so there's there's kind of like the three main ones. So you get this. You can see my mouse over this one. This is a composite, which is a single video um, cable. Uh, for those who had to deal with live through the analog days of VHS and all and DVDs, um, you probably were familiar with this. The yellow uh, RCA plugging into your TV in the back of the, your VHS or DVD player um, that carries all of the video signal um, in one single line, which is, makes for the least possible quality because um, you can't really make any adjustments made to the video affects the entire thing versus where you have something like S video, which is separated video, which the chroma and luminance is actually separated. Uh, so you can get you get a little bit better resolution out of the video as well as because of, you know, you can make minor adjustments to either the color or the, the brightness without affecting the other as much. And then there's these three bad boys here. Um, which are component, um, kind of annoying that they go composite and component to so get people confused. But this is basically uh, three video cables. Uh, you'll see this more on something like a Betacam machine. Um, some old DVD players might have came come with these as well. Um, but it's three separate video signals carrying different types of signals. Um, I think I have it listed here. Um, yeah, so it carries the Luma signal and then the Luma minus blue minus Luma and then red minus Luma. Um, or, um, or in some cases, depending on the type of machine, it's RGB related. It's kind of weird. Um, but I, and then um, but I think for the most part, if you're dealing with VHS, you're probably going to see the composite or S video. Uh, and whenever possible, you want to go with S video over composite because it is a, a, you'll be able to get a better resolution image out of. And what I mean by that is just like because of the brightness and color separation that you don't you, you don't get the uh, you get a just a sharper image out of it instead of like some possible uh, washing out of it. Um, uh, any questions yet? Okay. I hope I'm not going too fast or too hard on anybody. Um, time is it? Okay, we're pretty close to the end here. Um, I'll just kind of briefly go over some of these other ones. So equipment extras. So this is sort of like some things you'll want to have in your kit if you 
for if you do plan to digitize uh, isopropyl alcohol, 99% uh, is best um, because the uh, you can get 90, I think it's 94, and then it goes low as 70, but you want to go the higher better because uh, the remainder is basically water and you don't really want, and so that leaves kind of a water residue into the, the machines. Water is not great for them. Um, used to be before COVID, 99% uh, was really hard to get. You needed a special license to get it. Um, we have on-site conserva uh, on conservation, so we have somebody who had the ability to do that. But ever since COVID, now you could just buy it off the shelf. It's a lot easier to secure. Used to be, you had to get, you could only get 94%. Um, but at the bottom here, you have. Um, oh, uh, this is a blank VHS tape, so I like to keep blank tapes because sometimes. We, you may clean with the isopropyl alcohol and it still doesn't always necessarily work. So uh, sometimes the debris gets knocked loose by the roughness of a unused videotape. So I usually, if you have access to blank tapes, you can usually run them once, maybe twice for about 30 seconds of, at a time. And that will kind of help clean up the machine a little bit. If uh, cleaning within using the isopropyl alcohol doesn't seem to work. Uh, so these are chamois sticks down here, which is what you use. You want to use with cleaning your machine because they don't leave any. Uh, they don't fray and leave anything behind because the biggest problem you can have with something like a cotton swab is that if you clean a video head with it, it kind of frays and then you can get strands of that cotton stuck in the video head and that causes all kinds of problems. So you want to kind of stay away from that. So you want to stick with the chamois, something like a chamois thing. Uh, one trick I actually picked up was apparently in the tech shops at Sony, they used to just use blank paper because paper, unused paper is also kind of coarse. So you just dab that in isopropyl alcohol and then just uh, clean the machine with that and then uh, that seems to do the trick. Um, I use that also if I need to get like really deep cleaning. Um, the trick, the issue I guess when you're using the paper is sometimes you'll come in contact with the isopropyl alcohol so you want to have moisturizer handy because that you'll end up with really dry and cracked hands real quick. Um, uh, one other thing I don't have a picture of it, but we have a convection oven uh, for tapes that are. Um, yeah, so sometimes moisture gets into the binder and it separates the thing. So we, what you want to do is uh, some places use a food dehydrator. We have a we have a basically like a scientific convection oven. So we can bake the tapes for at like 40 C for eight hours. And sometimes that helps allow us to digitize the video. Um, um, uh, and then backup storage. So as I mentioned before, we back up to LTO tape system. The uh, one on the top is our old system. It was a standalone drive at LTO 4, and, but now we run an LTO 7 system where we have a tape library where uh, the thing at the bottom there, the T50E, has a mechanical arm in it, and on the sides is where we keep the tapes, which are these suckers here, which have barcodes on it, and so it helps the arm keep track of that sort of thing, and we use Retrospect backup software to kind of keep track of the uh, the listings and all that sort of stuff. And also it has a system, I can do scripting so I can automate over the weekend if I need to do a consistency check. Every six months I do consistency checks. So what I do is I'll set up a script. So I know approximately a tape takes about, I don't know, four to six hours to check. So I'll set up a script so that so many tapes will be checked over the course of the weekend or over the evening. So 
I, it helps in regards to because if it frees up the machine during the day in case I need to pull material from it. Um, the thing I guess with the backup storage for the, in this case is that it has a, up, a heavy upfront cost. So the going with the tape backup system that we have, the T50E, I think it was like about to get the computer, this library, uh, everything all set up. Uh, and then I think we got 40 tapes, I think, to start with. Uh, was about eighteen to twenty thousand um, dollars. The other thing I get, should also mention with these tapes is um, we do at a minimum we do duplicates. So there's two a, a set of two every time I back everything up as a minimum. Um, technically, in the backup world, uh, three copies is usually the minimum. Uh, I will probably, depending on you know. If we can increase our budget, the idea will be to maybe do a third offsite copy in case something happens. Um, that's something that I'm considering down the road. Um, uh, I know that in some cases, a lot of people don't have that kind of budget for things, and some people like to use cloud based services. Um, for other sections of our archives, we use Preservica which uses uh, the AWS. Um, uh, I did. I don't think I. Yeah, OK. Uh, right now I have something along the lines of. Uh, the amount of data that I have something in the range of 60 terabytes right now. Um, we were at a point where we were doing only about six terabytes of data a year. Uh, that has uh, increased substantially ever since we got a fi our high-end film scanner, so we can scan films at 4K and HD. So um, we're probably closer to 10 or more a year now. It's um, which, um, if we were to do all that on the cloud, would probably cost us a lot more pretty quickly compared to maintaining this current system. Um, Uh, and then software, like I mentioned before, uh, we use VRecord, uh, which, and then the Blackmagic does come with its own software. Um, the only issue I find with the Blackmagic software is that it doesn't have, it doesn't show you the video meters at all when you're trying to get your levels um, doesn't have the vector scope or the the waveform so it, you can't it's hard to properly ingest your video um, if you record at least you they have that baked into there um, um, what else uh, editing and transcoding yeah I use resolve for the most for if I need to do any editing, because it's just a little bit easier to do editing that way. Um, I know with FFmpeg slash Vuke Record, you can in command line trim the end, the the front, the beginning and end, at least. There's probably a way to concat the video files, but it's probably uh, personally I just find it easier with this resolve to make that happen. Um, but I do you have some scripts in place with FFmpeg to do the make the process change from converting the uncompressed video file into both the FFV1 and a uh, access copy at the same time. Um, the new Mac that we have is quite fast at being able to convert that stuff now. Very handy if I have to do it in a pinch. Uh, most of the time I will have a bunch of them set up and then let it run overnight. Um, again, uh, other tools that I've been looking into is that there's raw uncooked, uh, which deals more with, I think, with film 
So on the film aspect, I have been looking at that where it has the DPX conversion to FFB1 and then it, it can convert it back to the DPX, which is super handy because DPX captures get really huge really quick. So uh, I found that it's the quality to uh, size usage of FFB1 in the Mastroka container format has been very handy. Um, and I'm hoping to carry that over uh, with film. Right now, I'm still using JPEG 2000 with film as well versus the DPX. So, um, and then this last one here, just some links. Uh, AV artifacts, Atlas, uh, very handy to look at. Like it, people have been adding to it in terms of like the types of. Um, uh, issues you may come across and what the, and uh, they give examples of what it is. So if you're finding you're digitizing a video and you're finding that there's an issue happening, but you're not quite sure what it is, the AV artifact atlas is actually is a great place to go to for uh, trying to figure out what that issue is. Um, and then. Uh, I've been, I'm not a member, but I've been part of the subscribed list of the Association of Moving Images Archivists. Um, and they have a lot of uh, software that is related to uh, archiving uh, film and video and audio. Uh, Media Arena is another one of those ones. And then Labs Guy World is kind of like a guy who used to be a uh, a tech for old video equipment. Uh, his the video the the website itself focuses on more on like a lot of the older older equipment. So like the open reel stuff. So like Quadriga, um, half inch open reel, uh, all the type A, type B, and the three types and the type Cs and the like all the the really odd ball formats and uh, of the uh, Early open reel video and some and but he also talks about uh, umatics as well on there. Um, oh, I missed one. There was uh, umatic.pal or something like that. It's like a European website that talks about the PAL format as well. Um, the also uh, Lab Guys World does have an explainer more about like how video is uh, written to tape as well. Very handy. If you're not familiar with it, um, uh, obviously there's always. I'm always on the lookout for looking at tools and like the challenge is to find time to to test and find a way to incorporate those tools in there. So I, uh, I'm hoping next year that once a once I get more settled with uh, the whomever. Uh, uh, replaces Elena that I can start looking into that. So, um, yeah, that's, I mean, that's what I have. Um, hopefully, some people have some questions because I'm sure I glossed over things or confused people or. Thank you so much. I'm not seeing questions in the chat right now, but folks feel free to leave your questions in the chat or use the raise hand function. We can stay for a couple more minutes to answer any of your questions. Yeah, and then if you get, I mean, like I said at the beginning, if you got a question later on, you got my email, you can send me an email. We've got one in the chat from Don. Yeah. The umatic machines. Yes. Yeah. So we've been very lucky to secure some. Um, you, like I said, eBay is probably currently the best way. Um, I would have to I have come across some websites, but I think most of them seem to be selling more beta cam and. Um, VHS machines, but uh, I would check eBay mostly. But again, it's a total crapshoot in terms of finding one that's functional. Um, yeah, 
Um, and that's the thing. It could be anywhere from like it just needs new belts to the head, the tape mechanism won't load at all, or you might need to replace the head. Um, if you maybe send all, if just send me an email and uh, I could try to see if I can find a place that might be more, that could be more reliable in terms of, uh, but yeah, it's, the difficulty right now, the biggest challenge is keeping those machines running and having the knowledge to be able to fix those machines. And like for my end, I have some basic knowledge on how to do some maintenance. Uh, but again, finding the time to do the bigger problems, like I can replace belts, no problem, but um, I got a machine with a tape mechanism doesn't load properly, so it needs to be completely wiped down and re-greased. And then I think I need to also replace the drum because the heads on it are bad. Uh, we do have the heads for them, but yeah, it's... Uh, uh, thank you, Roger. Uh, I will have a look at that as well. Um, all kinds of resources out there. It's. Uh, Yeah. yeah. I was just going to ask if there are any other questions. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. That's all right. I... Give it a minute in case anyone's typing in the chat. Okay. If there, are, oh, if there are no further questions, um, Rob, I just want to thank you so much for your time and your talk today. This has been really informative and very great. And yeah, thank you so much. And again, we will be posting a recording of the webinar along with slides from Rob up on the call website later to, or either later today or sometime tomorrow. Um, and thank you everyone for attending. Thanks for having me. Ugh. Ugh.